I always tell this story about when I was a student interviewer and we had these really like kind of relaxed interviews. It was outside in Southern California. We were eating lunch. So it had this really relaxed environment. And um, I was interviewing this guy. He seemed really cool. He was nice. We were having a good conversation. And then he just started cursing, like adding in like the F word and stuff like that, as if you were talking to just like a friend. And it was totally inappropriate. It was just totally this level of unprofessionalism that you just shouldn't ever exhibit in a medical school interview even if you feel totally comfortable with that interviewer they're not your buddy they're not your best friend you have to maintain that level of professionalism throughout the entire thing so we have dr marinelli and dr nelson both on right now there's no way again that i can introduce themselves better than they can other than to tell you they are incredible incredible admissions experts Um, I'm going to let Dr. Marinelli and Dr. Nelson take it away, and I'll see you all in an hour. So (laughs) welcome, everyone. It's nice to kind of be a part of this uh, really huge experience. Uh, It's an honor to be talking here today. So um, the GPA and MCAT are kind of your entry point into the application process. It gets you kind of past that first filter screen. Uh, In fact, if you don't get past that filter screen, none of your other written materials are going to be reviewed in the holistic uh, application process where in front of the admissions committee. So you need a good GPA and MCAT score just to get to the admissions committees to review all of your other things. So starting with the GPA, you know, the average cumulative GPA of those that get accepted to allopathic medical school is around 3.75. And that stayed consistent despite, you know, a very large increase in volume of applicants. And the reason why, in my opinion, that has stayed consistent is because GPA is not apples to apples from institution to institution, nor between, you know, uh, different majors at one institution or even between, you know, one course. You might have two different uh, professors uh, teaching organic. One might grade inflate more than the other. So, you, you know, you need a good GPA to get in the game, if you will. And if you're between, you know, that three, six to three, nine range, you're going to get in the game. Mm-hmm. The MCAT is a bit more important because it is more apples to apples. It is more standardizable. And that's why uh, when the volume of applicants has gone up over the last decade, when, when it's doubled, um, the MCAT average went from 508 to what's uh, quoted as 512, but I think that's a low estimate. I would say more around 514, 515 is the average of those that matriculate into allopathic medical school. Yeah, absolutely. So it's just basically so important. And the reason why I, I took the time to pull this up is because I think this is just such a great way to kind of gauge where you stand. And not everybody has taken their MCAT when they're thinking about applying or a year out from applying. But once you have your GPA and MCAT in hand, then you can really kind of take a look at this table and say, hey, here are my chances. And I think there's uh, important kind of takeaways from this too. So let's look at somebody like with a 3.6 to and a 506 MCAT. They have about a 40% chance of getting in. And this is based on, you know, the previous cycles, applicants um, and other years. So overall, it gives you a good sense of how did those applicants perform that have similar stats as me? Obviously, there's other things taken into account, but as Dr. Nelson said, really to get your foot in the door and to have your application reviewed further, you need to have this kind of baseline stats. So somebody with a 40% chance, you know, that's not somewhere that's great to start. That's about the national average is about 40%. We love for this to be higher. And so what I really like to do and as an exercise with students is if you are starting off at like a 40% chance, what are the things that you can do to just change that right away? Can you retake the MCAT a few more points and get up to a 56% chance? That is That helps a lot. Moving your GPA, which is tough to do because that takes a lot of time to really bump up a GPA, that's going to get you up to 52%. So there's kind of different levers you can pull. And this graph um, really helps the applicant determine what that is. And the other thing that I really like to point out though, too, is that 
you know, this graph only, or this table only goes up to 3.79, doesn't stagger past there or greater than a 517. But even those people with the top stats, only about 83% of them are getting in. So it's not a hundred percent acceptance rate just because you have amazing statistics. There's other things there. Um, there's other parts of your application that you really have to have down and be thorough on. And that's kind of what we'll talk about for the rest of this presentation. So yep. let me let me stop sharing. And if, if you wanna comment, go right ahead, Dr. Nelson. I was <clears throat> gonna say, excuse me. Um, that I kind of look at the admissions process as kind of uh, algebra or chemistry equation. You know, there's different factors in that equation. And somebody asked in the in the in the Q and A how to balance out kind of a lower GPA. Well, if you have a lower GPA, the first thing you need to balance that out with is is a higher MCAT. And because if you don't have that, you're not even going to get to the holistic phase. But if you do get to the holistic phase, there are other ways that you can balance it out, and that's what we're going to kind of focus on as we go through here. Mm hmm. Absolutely. So what are those things, like we said, that you can do to really help maximize your chances? And that's so great that you said that of picturing it kind of as an algebra equation. I was never good at math, but that's kind of how I have it in my head. You know, there's three X plus five Y plus, <laughs> you know, seven <laughs> Z times whatever. And it's all just that balancing act and different levers you can pull. But these are the ones that I think applicants have a ton of control of. Sometimes they come to us and, you know, maybe they had not a stellar GPA. Maybe yep. their, you know, academic track record wasn't super great, but they've done some things to improve that. But they're still kind of that poor track record before, or maybe they're just struggling with the MCAT. It's not impossible to get in, but what are those other things that they can really, you know, put forward and really try hard on and control? And this is it. And so we'll talk about these individually, but you know, I think the most important thing is really being prepared and to plan. Um, There's so many different steps in the application process that you really have to know what's coming, what's expected of you, and be sure that you're on time um, with that. So as we go through, one of the things to talk about specifically is that timeline. And so this is like some graphic I made years ago, but it, it, so it's very pretty, but it is all very, very true still. It's the entire process of applying to medical school is really about a year and a half long. Um, and so you start in May of the year you're applying and that's when you submit your primary application. So I'm just kind of going over some terms for some people that maybe not be familiar. So that's when you submit the AMCAS application, which goes to all USMD schools. And then following that in the summer, you submit secondary applications, which are a series of essay questions from each school. And then after that, late summer and into the fall, you do interviews. And those interviews continue from the fall into the spring. And somewhere in that fall to spring timeline and through winter, of course, um, you may get an acceptance, you may get put on the wait list, and you may not know where you're going and get pulled off the wait list until May. So the whole process is really like over a year. And then like you don't actually matriculate into medical school until July or August the following year. So it is just a huge process. It's a marathon. There's so many little key points here and so much to do to prepare. Exactly. And I would actually, uh, if we if we were to update this, I would extend this way back at, <laughs> at you know, high school graduation. It would be kind of the start of this <clears throat> process, excuse me. And because, uh, you know, anything after high school really is relevant to your medical school application. Mm -hmm. And um, we've actually started a, a new port, part of med school coach called pre-med coach. And um, what we're doing is working with uh, students earlier in the process to kind of build that application going forward instead of kind of looking back at application time going, oh, I wish I would have done this or done that. Mm -hmm. So the earlier you can start on this, the better, because there's a lot of preparatory things that we're going to talk about in a minute, such as letters of recommendation, you know, activities, research, all those things that you can't get done, you know, during this timeline. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so when you're at that point in the application cycle, I just kind of like to put this here is that, you know, you really need to be paying attention to important dates. 
For those of you that are applying this year, these are actually the opening dates for AMCAS and TMD SAS. TMD SAS is the Texas application and AO Commas is the DO application. They haven't released theirs yet for this year, but it's probably around the same time as May 4th. Um, but basically, schools use most schools use something called rolling admissions, meaning they start reviewing applicants as they receive them. And so you basically to break it all down is you want to be as early as possible because you want to be one of those first applicants that gets reviewed, gets offered a secondary, and then a subsequent interview, and then possible acceptance. Um, the later you are in the cycle, the more applicants that they have ahead of you. And so your chances just get less and less and less. And so we really coach people to log into AMCAS on May 1st, start putting in all their information, start entering all of their courses, everything, and then hit submit right around May 28th. I mean, it doesn't have to be on May 28th, but I usually say within like a week or so is really the goal. Yeah, I get a lot of uh, students that are either reapplicants or doing a, a, a general advising session um, on why didn't I get in. And the first thing I do is I look at their submission date. Yep. Yeah, and correct me if I'm wrong on these statistics, Dr. Marinelli, but um, I think there was a study that was done a few years ago, on, and it was done on the TMDSAS application mm -hmm. process because that's a bit you know, a smaller volume to to focus in on. But if if a student, if there's two students that are otherwise pretty equal on all other parameters, and one student applies day one, another student applies in August, there's a 10% chance in that student applies who applies in August compared to the student of who applied day one with all other things equal. Mm -hmm. I don't know the exact data, but I know I remember that study. And yeah, it is definitely very, very significant. So um, thanks, you guys, so much for joining us this morning. This was a lot of fun. Dr. Nelson, it's always a pleasure. So I appreciate you know, your company. My pleasure, too. So thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Nelson, Dr. Marinelli. You guys are awesome admissions experts and really have helped so many students along the way. This was an awesome presentation.